Um, good morning. I wanted to, um, I was asked to talk about uh, paleoclimate, particularly the warm periods, and um, I was um, reviewing kind of the context here, the kind of an overview to, to, to give you, and so I, I just um, decided to kind of, kind of broadly brush across kind of what we know and highlight a lot of what we don't know, and of course what we, there is a lot that we don't know, and then also provide um, a little bit of insight of where we can find some um, new motivation. So there's still a lot of gap, um, but I believe that the, the interglacials themselves can provide a, a, a framework for um, understanding the overall climate evolution. And of course, um, so of course you all know, <coughs> most of you will know this uh, 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 Rosetta Stone that we use is the Lasecki Ramo um, benthic uh, Deloitteen stack from the World Oceans, and um, it's always been intriguing to me to think about. Um, while this is a, a global, supposedly global record, I think we need to we have to always ask ourselves, well, what would it look like if you just was looking at the Arctic? And I and I've also put up there both the terrestrial and the marine Arctic because um, so often reconstructions are, are put forward about the climate history of the Arctic without regard at all to the, to the, to the very rich land record that is there. So we have, a, we have to um, make that handshake between both the land and the sea record, and there's so much we don't know about the sea record uh, and the land uh, that we really are, are, uh, we have a, a, a large challenges ahead of us, and then of course the role that CO2 uh, played in that. Um, and I, and I just put up a, a grocery list, so to speak, of the kinds of things that are really important to understanding that Arctic uh, climate evolution. Um, and, and of course, uh, what, what, is, what I forgot to put on here is actually the ice sheet history is also an important part of that, what, uh, and, and the role that they played in, in, uh, as climate was modulated through the Milankovitch cycles. But certainly, sea ice history is an important aspect of this sea ice vulnerability, how little bit does it take to get rid of it? And I think we're experiencing that right now. Um, uh, climate models have not been able to reproduce how fast we're getting rid of it. So it tells us our models are really underestimating uh, the, the capacity. Um, and there are probably a lot of other surprises that we've uh, not been able to um, properly model. And, and uh, uh, so this, these are really important challenges. And, and I say they're challenges, but it also gives us wonderful justification for these drilling projects. I, I think this is like a no-brainer um, for, uh, for the kinds of works that we're going to propose. So um, I'm optimistic. It may take time, but I think it's opti I'm, I'm optimistic that we're going to be able to do this, these drilling projects eventually. Um, the, the sea level history is also quite important in this. Um, this old diagrams from uh, uh, Bill Manley's maps that are on the internet, uh, they're commonly used, but I, I think this is also important for understanding um, not only the uh, paleoceanography, but also the sea level history. As the, as the ice sheets modulated sea level, we have uh, transgression and regressive sequences that, um, at least in the shallow zones, uh, clearly truncate these records. And one of the motivations for our Chukchi um, drilling proposal is to actually capture a lot of that, the sea level history up in the shallow zone and trace that out into more continuous records uh, deliberately into the Arctic Ocean. So, so, it, it, it's, uh, uh, so we, we can go from a very truncated record into a more continuous record and then make the match back up into those different systems to really capture that depositional history. So, um, so that, that's certainly a, an intentional part of, of what some, many of the proposals are, are talking about. And so um, we all think this way, and we have today's climate, and we have the climate of the past, and through that there is a connection. And I think, again, we have easily a justification to what's happening in the Arctic right now, where we're going into the future. You know, we used to talk about where, you know, the climate's uh, changing so fast, we're going into the early Holocene, thermal warm period, then we used to talk about, well, now we're heading into the, into the last interglacial, and now I think we're pretty clearly heading into the Pliocene and, and the higher CO2 world. So um, this is the way we felt think, and I think this is easily easy for us to, to justify um, our proposals in that way. 
I put this in just for a point of humor. Um, if you know Doctor Who, I've been selling to the public the idea that we're like time lords. We go backwards and forwards in time and, and to look at how, how the climate uh, system has worked. And, and I think that we really have to think of ourselves, uh, uh, think of ourselves like that. Um, my introduction to the Arctic started in Baffin Island, but soon I worked on the North Slope of Alaska many, many years ago. I don't even want to say how long ago. But um, uh, mapping very long sequences here, and I have to say, I did this work in 1980, 1981 or so. There was so much sea ice, I had to sit for days with my Zodiac waiting to be able to move. And yet now I could have gone anywhere I wanted. Uh, in, in July and August, but I remember being iced in many times because there was so much ice here. You can see it's an offshore breeze on this particular day with this photograph. But we have a number of different high sea level events in here, particularly these, um, these older ones that are, are remarkably warm. And even the last interglacial brings us um, ecosystems that today are, are well to the south. In fact, some of these, these three here, we see um, uh, fossil assemblages that today are only seen in northern Japan or south of the Aleutians. And yet here they were, these very warm uh, floors and faunas, uh, uh, both the uh, diatoms and, and particularly the, the uh, 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 carbonate fossils that, that were in the Arctic basin, some of which preclude even winter sea ice. And yet that doesn't make sense when we look at other um, kinds of proxies. So we've got a lot of, of disconnects. We're seeing part of the story here, part of the story there. It doesn't match. So we've got to find out where that common ground is. And I want to make a, make a point here. Um, I haven't published this yet, but this unit here used to be uh, about 2.4 <coughs> million. And we're going to move it up to about 1.1 million, I believe. Um, but uh, uh, there is some evidence for that. I actually published that in the mid-1990s, we suggested that this could, in fact, be true. And I'm beginning to think that that really, really is true. And what that means is even more recently, even as recently as a million years ago, we had extremely warm conditions in, uh, in the Arctic. Um, so, so, but these are the high sea levels. These are huge gaps of time in between each of these. And this can only be a fraction of the real story uh, about the Arctic. Uh, and again, this is some old maps out of uh, uh, that just show you that, in fact, if you really squint, like this is the north slope of Alaska, if you really squint, you can see some terraces up there, uh, uh, up to uh, 30 or 40 meters, that contain these very, very high uh, sea level uh, events um, with some kind of uh, slight uh, accommodation for uh, probably some kind of uplift to get them to where they are. And we can match these with uh, Dave Hopkins' original work uh, down in, in Nome uh, very easily now, and all up through Kivalina and up around the coast. And we've found some equal uh, deposits of equal age on the Russian side, uh, again, above sea level. But what there is offshore is really um, yet to be discovered. Uh, <clears throat> this is an old cross section of Dave Dinter's um, off in the Beaufort Sea over here. And, and there are some real problems with the age calls that he had in that. Um, uh, in fact, we, we, were, we weren't good friends for a long time because we argued so intently about this particular profile. Um, but again, we need, even though there's seismic data out here, I learned from the Kananaskis meeting that in fact we still really don't know um, a lot of the actual age of this because the old companies, as far as I know, are blasting through that because their, their interests are, 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 are deeper in the sediment profile. Um, this, I showed in Kananaskis, is just a, a, a compilation of the various seismic units that Dave Dinter has and various people that I was familiar with um, over the years, trying to map them into our um, above sea level uh, story. But what the match is across here, we really don't know this, this series of, of, of of seismic units are, are across in this region. And, and I put some circles out here because of, of, of where we think that might go. But I also want to make up some, put some question marks back on that because we really haven't tested this with any proper drilling to get that entire story. So that, again, motivates some of the 
<clears throat> some of the work that we're talking about here. This should be somewhat broken with unconformities, the sea level uh, rises and falls. Um, we know, for example, that um, in some of the units in here, uh, particularly some of the younger units, there are some boreholes off the Prudhoe Bay that's, that certainly suggests that the Atlantic water layer got up onto the shelf and shallowed and shoaled. How do we do that? We have to unstratify the Arctic Ocean. Um, and how do we do that? So we have some big questions about whether that's, uh, how that's possible uh, uh, over time. So, so this is a challenge, and, it, and, it, and I think it also provides a lot of justification for what we want to do. And again, I want to add over here, I was having a discussion with John Gloss and Tom Lakeman at the Arctic Workshop in, at UMass um, just the last couple of days, and really trying to think about how the uh, older units uh, on shore map into the um, offshore areas in here and what the, the uh, uh, particularly the interglacial units look like in there. And it, and it seems to be that there's still some disagreement as to what is the top of the Beaufort Formation, what is the age of the Beaufort, upper Beaufort Formation in this, in this area. Um, and of course we have this, what we also need to have are we have to get a better handle on what the results are from the from the uh, Bering Sea leg, because that's also going to provide wonderful justification for looking what's happening on the north side of the Bering of the Bering platform. Um, so this is uh, uh, out of the scientific drilling unit. There's, you can see that this goes back to about three or four million in places, and we want to know well, what we're, what, we're, what is the history that they're finding there, and how can this also add. Um, wonderful uh, momentum and impetus for the drilling that we propose to all are thinking about on the north side of the, of the Bering Land Bridge. Um, I want to just uh, uh, spend the last five minutes here or so that I have just talking about the Lake E, e project, Lake Elbegikin project. Now this is on land, it's not ocean, but I want to show you what a continuous record might look like uh, and some of the challenges that, that we have. And, and I apologize, I'm going to skip many slides, so um, I'm doing that intentionally. I just got, uh, having had a workshop with 100 people over the last three or four days, I've been exhausted, so I didn't quite get these edited quite the way I wanted to, so you'll have to forgive me for that. Um, so anyway, the, the Algegitkin meteorite impact crater occurred right here. It's right on the continental divide of the uh, Adhoks Chukotka volcanic belt, belt that Dave was talking about. Um, uh, <coughs> and it's a, uh, 18 kilometers in diameter. And we were able to get in there and drill um, down in through the 315 or 318 meters of of sediment here, and I want to mention too, I, I um, <coughs> realize I don't have a slide out here. This was an international project. Um, my, my German chief scientist was Martin Mellis, my Russian chief scientist was Pablo Manuk, and then we have an army of about 50 or 60 graduate students and research associates who are working on this. So um, uh, I want to make sure that I mention that. This is a huge international project. Um, but the, the good thing here is we got a continuous record back um, to uh, 3.6 million. And um, to make a long story short, I will go through this really quickly. These are marine isotope stages in here that we published last July in Science. And these up and down wiggles are more or less like the Lisecki Ramo curve in, in some ways. Um, but this is the stage 31 I mentioned before. This possibly equivalent to the Fish Creek in. Um, very, uh, what we get from our uh, July temperatures were much, much warmer than anything we've seen in the, in the last few glacial cycles. And certainly it was much, much wetter. Now, the only other time we get, and this is stage 11, about 410,000 years ago, much wetter, much warmer than ever, than we'd ever seen before. And, and again, this raises some interesting challenges. I have this, if this is the Fish Creek in uh, offshore in the marine environment, this would be what we call the Wainwrightian um, offshore in the marine environment. But again, we need to make that, um, get that connection much more uh, uh, solidified. And um, <clears throat> we see that these warm units like stage 11, stage 31, there are many different super warm interglacials 
and they seem to match up with the, these, this stratigraphic section here is actually from Antarctica. And wherever you see these yellow units in here means the West Antarctic ice sheet was gone. So at both poles, we had um, not only the retreat of the West Antarctic ice sheet, probably some unknown amount of lowering in the East Antarctic ice sheet, we had dramatic warmth in parts of the Arctic at the same time. This ought to be reflected in the marine environment. And the marine environment has to have this, this story, um, and, and yet we don't have any record of that offshore um, per se, because we don't have the proper uh, units for that. On, on land, we have, and I want to just leave it like, you know, up till three million years ago, the Arctic looked like this on the, on the Alaska, on the uh, North American side. And because of that, tree line can go away for the north. We have a very different albedo, different uh, continental, continentality in this, in this area. And again, so what, what, how is this reflected in some of the units off sh in, the, in the marine environment? I think this is a wonderful opportunity. We've got a whole bunch of units here that reflect. These are particularly all, um, all Pliocene in age. But tell us of a very warm, very warm uh, Pliocene environment on land. Um, with full-blown forest, uh, forested environments all the way up to the north coast. There wasn't any tundra. Tundra was gone uh, in, this environment, in, in, this, in these time periods. And, but, but evolved over time into what we see. And so we're uh, beginning to get a handle on that. I'm going to skip. Um, uh, well, this one just particularly shows um, a big change at about 2.5. 7.3 million years ago. Again, where is that in the Arctic, in the, in the marine environment? Let's find that, that story. This is from 2.2 to 3.6 million years ago. And, um, but it's much more complicated than that. This is, this is our biome model from on land. Again, we've got forested conditions all the way from 3.6 million to 2.2. Um, and we lose, start losing the trees somewhere around 2.9 million. And we go into taiga, taiga and uh, cold deciduous forests and eventually into, into tundra. So that evolution in the Arctic borderlands should be reflected in some way offshore in the marine environment. And we particularly see a huge shift here at, at about um, 2.7 million years ago. This is the mean annual precipitation reconstructed. There's a huge drop in precipitation there. What the heck caused that? Was that the onset of sea ice in the Arctic Ocean? We don't know. We're still trying to figure that out. We can't get the models to, to reproduce that directly. Actually, I've been trying to get in touch with Rob DeConto, who's been run, running some models of that uh, for revisions for a paper. Um, and uh, so I'm, <laughs> a couple of you know how just how desperate I am about getting in touch with him. This green line here shows you our reconstructed July temperatures from 2.2 to 3.6 million. And this dashed line is the Holocene, early, early Holocene thermal maximum. This Pliocene summers were much, much warmer than anything we've seen in the Holocene. And that, that's quite a surprise. So what did that do to sea ice? We'd like to know. It'd be great to get a record from the Arctic Ocean and the, and the Arctic borderlands that we could compare with this, with this particular record. So it was warmer and wetter in the Pliocene. Now we had something radical happen that only was repeated. The high precipitation only happens again when we get these super interglacials. And we see the demise of the, uh, of the uh, West Antarctic ice sheet. Um, let's see, let me. And we see some changes in the, these are Elkanone records from Laura Kara Lawrence back here to three point in. This is the North Atlantic uh, sea surface temperatures. Look at this, up at uh, over 18 degrees, uh, stepping down through time. And how we would like to know how that compares with our, um, with our, with the Arctic borderlands and with what's happening with the various CO2 estimates. We don't have enough people working on um, reconstructing paleo um, carbon dioxide uh, uh, in these records. So uh, again, that's a, a, a even more of a justification for getting these Arctic records. And, it, and this one I just show you uh, through the same period, the sea level record that's come out from Ken Miller and many, many scientists doing their backstripping uh, on various continental shelves 
would certainly suggest that sea level was only not going back and forth about uh, 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 20 or 30 meters. That's hardly 140 meters like we saw in the last glacial maximum. And even by 2.5 million, sea level was only operating about uh, 60, 70 meters, and which doesn't suggest very large ice sheets. So how was that sea level history? Can we find that sea level history on the Arctic coast uh, off the Beaufort and Chukchi shelf and contribute to what we might know about that, that history? <coughs> uh, let me fast forward a couple, we're gonna go past the modeling story here and go to this one. Um, in the review process for this paper, um, we, we recon decided to reconstruct not only the summer temperatures through this record, but a winter climate evolution. And it was really actually a lot of fun. This, this is about a week old. Um, and this shows you that um, in trying to reconstruct the coldest temperature of the seasons, we see that in fact, um, um, still see temperatures in these reconstructions are still in the cold range. And so what did that do to sea ice? It would say, how often did we have seasonal sea ice in the Arctic? Um, and, and at what point did it become perennial? And we can look at that. We see that once temperature drops below about minus 35, the ecologists tell us you lose the boreal forest. The conifers can't reproduce. And that seems to fit reasonably well uh, with that. So, we, so we've got some new ways of thinking about both summer temperature, winter temperature. And what does this reconstruction on land and the land <coughs> say about what what's going on with sea ice, what does the vegetation history tell us about near, nearby sea ice um, history? So, um, let's see. I need to pass by that one, and just, um, yeah, I'll go to this one. Again, just a very, I, I, um, this is a paper I'm just hoping to get resubmitted uh, over the next couple of days, maybe early next week, uh, if I get all the Rob Picardo, um, with my, his modeling efforts. Uh, that he's finishing up, and um, and I and I put this out there because now we have something goes back to 3.6 million. If we could get something equivalent to that, continuous records and and map in the sea level history and the interglacial history um, in the um, in the offshore, uh, we could really rewrite the history of the Arctic and the Arctic climate evolution um, uh, in ways that we right now we only have this this patchy. Uh, way of looking at it. And I think the other justification we have it easily it's a no-brainer that we're heading into the Pliocene right now in terms of our climate, in terms of our PCO2. Um, we're, we're really um, uh, at this point where we have these, these kind of tipping points into some kind of new climate regime. And I think that also makes our, what we're trying to do in terms of paleoclimate um, drilling, up, uh, drilling justifications is really kind of a no a no brainer. Thank you very much. Question for Julie? You'll notice I used the singular.